What an amazing honor it is to be in this room. The finest brain cells in Asia are right here. But that's enough about me. Oh, it's great to have you here. And uh, let's see, uh, can I just do a quick survey? Hands up if you were born in Asia. Hands up if you were born elsewhere on this planet, outside Asia. Okay, hands up if you were born in a third location not yet mentioned. <laughs> okay, one, two, three, four. Hands up if you are female. Interesting. Hands up if you're male. Okay, hands up if you're not sure. <laughs> one, two, okay. Just three people not sure. Okay, we have a nice creative group here, I can tell. And uh, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is the story in your head. Um, I'm a book writer, and I write lots of books. I've written about 30-something books, uh, some for children. A lot of them are murder mysteries, and I teach other people to do the same, to uh, take the stories out of their heads, out of their hearts, and put them on the page. Some I organize prizes, the Man Asian Literary Prize, the, uh, um, the Hong Kong Young Writer, the Scholastic Book Award. Um, I help start all these uh, awards, and uh, I use the internet and newspapers as well. Um, now, I'm going to talk about, to start with, uh, the creativity aspect. Now, am I more creative than the average person in this room or in Hong Kong? I don't think so. In fact, this generation is considered not, gen not creative. Asians generally are considered not creative. And uh, here's an example of why. We can create buildings very quickly, but can we think of names for them? We're not very good at it. What's the central part of Hong Kong called? <laughs> now, if you go to Google Maps and look at the building in the middle of central, you'll find what it's called. Opposite central building, there is a tower, and you can guess the name of it, probably. Central Tower. <laughs> That's right, Hong Kong is generally not known for its uh, creativity. And in fact, uh, consider our harbour. London has the Thames, uh, Paris has the Seine, New York has the Hudson, but our harbour is called the harbour. <laughs> Hong Kong has more skyscrapers than London and New York put together. But um, mm, thinking of names for them is tough. There's a commercial building in Central called Commercial Building. <laughs> There's a skyscraper in Tin Hao called Skyscraper. <laughs> and in fact, it's very short. It's only, about, it's only about this high. In fact, we are not very creative. Sometimes we think, let us be creative. Let us use an adjective like those clever Western people. And so we have Greenish Court. <laughs> which is actually white. <laughs> we have Newish Building. <laughs> newish Building is on Nathan Road, and uh, it's very old. <laughs> we have Adjoining Building. <laughs> adjoining Building, I think, must be a building with a bit of an identity crisis. <laughs> no personality of its own. We have the quite good Chinese <laughs> restaurant. I used to go to this place every day on Electric Road, it was near my office, and every day I'd go in and uh, at the top of the menu was the restaurant's signature dish, which was quite good noodles. <laughs> I actually think this is very good marketing because, uh, you know, most restaurants go for people who want great food. They've got their own little niche. What if you want mediocre food? <laughs> Here's where you go. Um, of course, um, my favorite restaurant in Hong Kong sadly has closed down. It was a vegetarian restaurant. And you can tell me what it was called, can't you? <laughs> Correct. In vegetarian restaurant, all the waitresses had a name badge just here. And every name badge said, Waitress. The name badges served to differentiate the girls from the plants and the fish and the furniture. So that's the creativity of my generation. Fortunately, things are changing. And that's what my message is uh, for you today. 
maybe we don't value stories enough in Hong Kong. That's why we've got into this uncreative situation. Uh, I'm going to tell you my own personal story, using as illustration some film posters and book covers uh, which I collect. Um, this is the first movie I ever saw, a uh, first cartoon I, was, I saw. And what happened to Bambi's mother? Do you remember? <laughs> she got shot. I cried. I told my parents, you should not take me to these violent movies. This is adults only. My mother said, oh, I'm sorry. So she took me to this one. <laughs> this story begins, once upon a time there was a beautiful girl with snow white skin. She had a loving mother and father, but then her mother died. I said to my mother, the mother died again. <laughs> so she took me to this movie, and I watched this movie with great suspicion. There's the boy, there's dad, where's mum? <laughs> mum is missing. What did he do with the body? She took me to Cinderella, which begins, once there was a beautiful girl with a loving mother and father, but then the mother died. <laughs> I decided that Walt Disney only made movies because he hated his mother <laughs> and wanted to kill her again and again. She took me to the Jungle Book and she said, it's, a, like, it's about a little boy just like you, he's small and brown and bad tempered. And in the movie, you discover what happens to Mowgli's parents. They are eaten alive by a tiger. So the parents keep on dying. Here is Belle in Beauty and the Beast. What does Belle's mother look like? Answer, we don't know. She's dead. What does Ariel's mother look like? We don't know. She's dead. What does Jasmine's mother look like? We don't know. She's dead. Okay, so clearly there is a trend going on here. By the time Tarzan came out, I was an adult and I was already a children's book writer. And I realized something. None of these stories were written by Walt Disney. He was not a story writer. They are all based on children's books. It's not Walt Disney who hated his mother. It's children's book authors. I realized that I would never be successful because I love my mother. When Tarzan came out, yes, beginning with the story of an abandoned baby and dead parents, I realized that something deeper was happening here. Now, at the same time, uh, the Disney studio um, announced it wasn't going to use old children's books anymore. It was going to develop its own stories about aliens and cars and all sorts of things. And so they did. And this was one of the first original stories. And you can tell it's about an alien. Or is it? No, it's really about Lilo. What does Lilo's mother look like? Killed in a car crash just before the story begins. Then came a story of a fish. I was sitting in the front row of the cinema. And it starts off with a mummy fish swimming along. And I'm there and I shout out, she's going to die. <laughs> And you know what happens. Hannah Montana, based on a true story. There's one difference between Hannah Montana in real life and Hannah Montana in the movie. And you know what that is. In the movie, Mummy is dead. OK, so there are some serious issues that children's books deal with. And one of them is the fact that one day we're going to be independent without our mothers. In fact, stories are the most important communication tool there is. And children's book writers know that one of the hardest lessons you have to learn is one day your mummy won't be there. If you take a kid and say, one day mummy will be dead, what's the kid going to do? <laughs> if you take a kid and say, I'm going to tell you the story of Snow White. In fact, it's the same message. One day mummy won't be here, but you'll be fine. Watch how you'll be fine. So this message of, uh, of uh, hope that you'll be independent, you'll be fine without your parents, is something that children's book writers deliver, and Walt Disney delivers, and all uh, people who serve stories to children deliver. So you can see, indeed, that stories have a very serious point to them. What about the story in your head? Do you have a serious contribution? 
Now, most stories tend to come from the West, or so we think. What about here in Asia? Uh, year 2000, there were lots of lists produced, lists of 100 great books, 100 great CDs, 100 great movies. Nearly all the cultural items on all those lists were from the West. If we uh, did surveys of the greatest books and greatest movies using Asian audiences, we got the same answers. All the great books, all the great movies, all the great CDs were from the West. So there's a culture gap going on. Where is Asian creativity? In fact, there is Asian creativity, but we need to dig deep to find it. Let's look at uh, how we create a story. Um, I'm going to look at the most popular story of recent years, certainly for the generation of the speakers, which would be Star Wars, okay? 1970, late 70s. Uh, it starts off away from the places of the rich and powerful. It starts off on a little planet in the middle of nowhere. Anybody tell me what the planet was called? Oh, I'm surrounded by nerds. <laughs> Tatooine, it was called. And um, it was a very ordinary place. And there lived a young man. What was the young man's name? Wrong. Luke Skywalker, correct. The younger one said Anakin, the older one said Luke. Uh, Luke was the young man, and he had no mother and father. Well, no mother, that's not surprising, is it? He lived with his uncle and aunt, and one day he encounters these strange visitors. Remember CP3O? And um, they, they give him signs that something odd is happening. He meets a man with a beard who has a message for him. What's the man with the beard called? Obi-Wan Kenobi. And Obi-Wan says, Luke, you are not a normal human being. You are a Jedi. You have a mission. He says, go and fulfill your destiny. And so Luke leaves the planet Tatooine and he goes and he, um, he travels uh, and he meets a pretty girl. Uh, what's the girl called? Princess Leia. And Princess Leia does not become his girlfriend. When you first see them, pretty boy, pretty girl, you think, aha, they'll be kissing soon, but they're not. <laughs> Remember that. Remember that, okay? He learns to travel on some amazing transport. Can anybody tell me the name of his plane? Millennium Falcon and X-Wing. Oh, this is serious nerd city. <laughs> he battles the bad guy. We all know the name of the bad guy, Darth Vader. He's evil, scary-looking dude in uh, big black robes. And our hero wins the fight, but not using conventional weapons. How does he win the fight? Remember, he turns his normal stuff off, and he gets in touch with a good spirit outside himself. Feel the force, Luke. Feel the force. And that's how he wins the battle. Star Wars ends with a big party in a big hall. Okay? So that's the biggest story of recent years. And I'm going to tell you another story very quickly away from the dwelling places of the rich and powerful. In fact, I'm going to tell you the same story. In a place where ordinary people live, the suburbs, there lived a young man, and his name was Harry Potter. <laughs> he had no mother and father. <laughs> he lived with his uncle and aunt. One day, strange encounters lead him to realize, remember the white owl flies into his house? He meets a man with a beard who has a message for him. <laughs> Hagrid says, Harry, you are not a normal human being. You are a wizard. You have a mission. He says, Harry, go fulfill your destiny. So Harry goes off and he uh, goes to Hogwarts and he starts training. And what does he do? He meets a pretty girl. What's her name? Hermione, and we think Hermione, oh, they're going to be kissing soon, but she does not become his girlfriend. <laughs> and there's more. He learns to travel on some amazing transport, and he battles the bad guy. The bad guy is an evil, scary-looking dude in a robe. Our hero wins the fight, but not using conventional weapons, exceptional courage, and the spirit of his parents. Party ends with a bit, the film ends with a big party in a hall, Hogwarts Hall, okay? So we find that the two biggest stories are the same story. 
Now I'm going to keep going one more time, just briefly, a place called the Shires. And the young man was called Brodo Baggins. And this is my edition of Lord of the Rings, that, the old, really old one. He had no mother and father. He lived with his uncle Bilbo. He encounters something strange. A man with a beard called Gandalf. You are not a normal hobbit. You are the ring bearer. You have a mission. Go, young hobbit. Go and fulfill your destiny. So he travels away with some amazing companions, and we find he meets Sir Arwen, who does not become his girlfriend. He has an amazing journey, and so on. Battles of bad guys, etc., etc. Okay? So what do we find? We find that the three biggest stories of the last few years are the same story. <laughs> that story is the story that's in your head. It's in your head. And in fact, we find that same story everywhere. We find the same story in true stories, biographies of real people who really lived. Because there's some story in your head, which is about a young man who has some mis mystery over his parentage, who meets a man with a beard, who gets some advice from the man with a beard, who goes on and changes the world. Think of real life stories of people you know. Think of Buddha. Buddha was born, his mother dies. Uh, a, a, a guru with a beard approaches and says, you are going to be the Buddha. Think of Jesus. Jesus, mystery, mystery over his parentage. And what happens? The first thing he does as an adult, he goes to John the Baptist, a man with a beard. What does John the Baptist say? You are the chosen one. Go and fulfill your mission. Uh, think of uh, other great people. That story is imprinted somewhere in your mind. We all have stories imprinted in our minds. It's a matter of getting them out there, getting them on paper. Okay, the consumers of the world are Asian. 62% of the world's population are Asian. That means the ones who buy the movies, who buy the books, um, these are people who are in need of Asian stories. So this is the time when you need to be creative. You need to create the next generation of stories, the next generation of movies. Those stories are in your head. All you need to do is find some time and unlock it, okay? And then send them to me, and I'll send them to my publisher. Thank you. Goodbye.